guys, it's Dirt Lifestyle. We're going to talk all about lockers. I've been getting asked to do this video for a long time, so here you go. This video will be a combination of facts and opinion. As of right now, the making of this video, I'm not sponsored by any locker manufacturers and have no allegiance to anyone. I'm putting this video together to teach beginners what lockers are and what my experience has been with various manufacturers in this industry. In this video, we're going to cover open differentials, spools, lockers, and everything in between. To keep things simple, I'm not going to talk about exactly how they work, but I am going to talk about exactly what they do and what the pros and cons are for each. Let's start this video with the basics. Let's talk about open differentials. This just has a series of spider gears, and the way it's designed, it makes it to where with one, with one tire spinning, you can spin the other side at a different rate. So if the driver's side needs to spin faster because you're turning passenger, um, it allows the passenger to spin slower while the driver's side spins faster. This is great for on the street, but it sucks off-road because the way it's designed, one tire can get a ton of traction, the other one will have no traction, so one tire will just spin, and redneck terms, we call that a one tire fire. One tire fire will not allow you to go forward or backwards, um, it'll just be ma making a whole bunch of uh, wheel spin, and that's not good off-road. All right, can you see me? Yeah, you can see me. This is a spool, this is the next thing I wanna talk about. A spool locks both axle shafts together, and as you can see, I can't spin these axle shafts. This is a spool from a Ford 9 inch. These are Dana 60 axle shafts, but it's all 35 spline, so it, it goes together just fine. But as you can see, if I spin one side, the other side spins with it, and that's a problem on the street. I mean, unless you're a drifter. If you're a drifter, you love this. <laughs> but if you're somebody who's not a drifter and you're just trying to get to work, this is an issue. Um, as you can see, there's spider gears in here. There's no spider gears or anything in here. This is just like one big machined piece of steel that you bolt everything to. The ring gear bolts onto uh, the outside here. And it is a great way and a cheap way to get traction off road, but it is a horrible way to build something that is universal between street and off-road performance. The next differential we're gonna talk about is a Lincoln Locker. This is not a Lincoln Locker, this is an open differential, but using a Lincoln welder or whatever welder you got, you weld in between these spider gears and you turn this into that. So you turn what you have, which is an open carrier, into what you want, which is a spool if you're just going off-road. Now, for us, it would be a Miller locker, but you literally just take your squirt gun and you squirt a whole bunch of hot steel in between all these gears. You get them all to stick together, and it's that simple. This is a really inexpensive way to get quick traction off-road. Obviously, there's huge downsides. I mean, it's gonna be horrible on the street. Well, at least it'll function like a spool. And I have seen people break um, Lincoln lockers, but I have not seen someone break a spool. So I would say that if done incorrectly or not welded um, solid enough, that this can still be pretty unreliable, whereas a spool is about as reliable as it gets because from the factory, there's no moving parts at all. The next differential I wanna talk about is limited slip. So this is a limited slip that has a series of clutch packs in it. And what this does is it literally limits the slip between the two tires. So if one tire is on a really slippery surface like ice, the other tire is on a, a surface you have tons of traction like rocks or something like that, it makes it to where you don't just get the one tire fire effect we were talking about like you would out of an open carrier. So this will limit the amount of slip between the two, but also give you the ability to run the two tires at different speeds. So on the street, you're gonna get performance very similar, I mean, almost identical to what you're gonna get out of an open carrier, but off-road, it's gonna act a little bit more like a spool, but not quite that good. So um, you, you can get one tire up in the air, and if your tires are big enough, they will overwhelm this, no problem. So then it will act much more like an open carrier off-road, but if you're not in an extreme situation or if you don't have extremely big tires, these work pretty damn good. There's two main types of limited slip differentials, and the first one we just saw on the bench. It has a series of clutches in it, and it helps to limit the amount of slip from one side to another, and it's great to about a 31 in my opinion. Once you get to like a 33, uh, it's still really good off-road, but if you're in rocks, if you're in some extreme terrain, you will notice that if one tire is pinned down in between two fat rocks and the other one is loose, one will spin and the other one will stay locked in just like it's an open differential. And the tire size has a lot to do with that because of leverage. Now, if you stay to a 31 or smaller, these are gonna work awesome. There's, there's nothing wrong with these as long as you use the right uh, lubrication and you make sure that your clutch packs are healthy. The second style limited slip differential is my personal favorite and that is the Torsen style or Torsen style. Pretty sure it's Torsen. <laughs> And it, this works really well. Detroit True Tracks fall into this category, and I had a set of Detroit True Tracks on my TJ for years. They're good up to about a 35, and then I think that you notice the performance degrade pretty quickly after that. Now, there's some different things to think about when it comes to this, 
my experience was they were awesome off-road out of 35 and then whenever I would get into rocks you would notice one side would spin way faster than the other side and in some cases some extreme cases it would act like an open differential if you have an automatic you can just tap on the brake and it will help these out a ton but I don't have an automatic I have a manual um, I decided to just upgrade to full-blown lockers once I got past 35 just so I didn't have to worry about tapping on the brakes and doing all this other stuff while I'm trying to go up serious obstacles. The next category is automatic lockers like you would find from Detroit or from Yukon. And these are a really good option for a lot of people in my opinion. I really liked my Detroit for the time that I had it. The Detroit soft locker was really strong. I've heard really similar results out of the Grizzly lockers. And this is something that kind of has a mind of its own. You don't have the control over when it's locked and unlocked, but in a perfect world, it's designed to be good on the street. So when you're taking a corner and you're not throttling through, um, it should be unlocked and it should turn and function very similar to an open differential. Um, unfortunately, I didn't live in a perfect world when I had mine. so. Most of the time it performed great on the street, but there were times where it just had a mind of its own and it would unlock and lock at will because you know it's guessing whether or not you need the traction or not and it's doing it all mechanically. There's no computer here. So I would say that it worked really good. Um, not great if you want like 100% streetable performance, but it just depends on what your application is. Off-road, it was really reliable. It pretty much stayed locked in all the time when I was off-road, which has its pros and cons. It was great if I was in rocks, but it sucked if I was on a muddy trail trying to turn and I wanted to have the performance of an open differential because you're gonna be able to turn so much easier whether you're on or off-road. The next category of locker fits directly into the automatic locker category, and that is lunchbox lockers. Lunchbox lockers take up the space that was once your spider gears. You basically pull your spider gears out of there, you put this locker in there, and it ratchets around corners. Um, there's, there's so many pros and cons to this. I am not a fan of lunchbox lockers. That being said, I've got a budget build that um, I will definitely be using lunchbox lockers in, at least that's the plan right now, because they're very cost effective. You've gotta be able to withstand the idea of it constantly banging in and out of being locked and unlocked. Uh, it ratchets around corners, they're really noisy. Um, they can be strong if you wheel correctly, but I have seen a number of them fail on the trails. So it's, you've just gotta weigh the pros and cons. They're so inexpensive that they're really enticing for a lot of people. I'd say they're great if you just wanna get some quick traction now, and then you can save up for some like one tons in the future, and then you're gonna put real lockers in the one tons. So I think it's perfect for that. But if you plan on wheeling this rig for 20, 30 years on these axles, I would recommend saving up and getting a real locker instead of a lunchbox style locker. But again, it's all depending on whatever your um, costs and whatever your uses of the vehicle. So don't light me up too bad in the comments. I know there's a lot of guys out there that are just like lunchbox or die, <laughs> but I am not one of those guys. And so this is my take on lunchbox lockers. The last category we're gonna to cover today is selectable lockers. I personally really like air lockers. I've had pretty good luck with them over the years, but there's a whole bunch of different reasons that air lockers are good and the air lockers are bad. On the good side, you can select when you have traction and when you don't. So it makes it to where you can turn the locker off, turn very easily on the street or off road. And then whenever you need it, you can flip the locker on and it acts just like a spool. On the downside, you need a 12 volt power source and you need air. My air lockers are being fed by a CO2 tank. It's very reliable. Basically when it's empty, it's empty. When it's full, it's full. There's no electrical or anything that has to go on with the air source, but it has to travel through a nylon line that goes under the cab and then it goes to two solenoids right here. So the two solenoids are being fed by one air line. Then one of those solenoids will actuate the front locker and one will actuate the rear locker via an electric switch. So it travels from the solenoid. It's gonna be hard to see, but it goes down into this airline right here. And then it converts from a nylon airline into a copper airline that then feeds the locker and tells it to turn on or off. In order to get it to turn on or off, these solenoids are powered by two switches. I've got one right here that is a front locker and one right here that's a rear locker. This is how most systems are ran, with the exception of the CO2 tank. It seems like most people use a 12 volt tank or a 12 volt uh, uh, compressor instead of a CO2 tank. I prefer a CO2 tank, but it's, it all just depends on whatever your preference is. Now, what I can say about air lockers is I've never had an issue with a blown line. I've never had an issue with an electric solenoid not working or anything like that, but I did have to replace the rear seal housing. 
um, once and the front locker I blew up last year after about four years of hard use. So take that for what it is. That's just the reliability. So on the whole, I haven't had an issue with the system. <laughs> the, all the stuff that you would think you'd have problems with, airlines, 12 volt, um, I haven't had an issue with any of that. I've only had an issue with the lockers themselves, a leaky O-ring and the seal housing in the rear, and then I blew up the front locker once. The next selectable locker we're gonna talk about is an electric locker. I really like the concept of electric lockers. I like the simplicity of electric locker. Um, and basically it's, it's, it works with just the same switch that I would have on the dash in my TJ. You just turn it on, it sends an electric current to an electromagnet, it locks the locker together. You're not worried about running out of air, you're not worried about a busted airline, none of that stuff. You're only worried about the electrical portion. So I'm really attracted to that idea. I'm not so attracted to the idea of if you have really dirty fluid and you have a lot of metal shavings in there, which believe it or not, that happens in all differentials. I don't want all that to stick to this electromagnet. I'm not sure if this is a common problem or not, but this is something that I've just always thought about whenever I'm researching what kind of lockers to do it with what builds. I'm definitely going to use an electric locker in the future. I'm not sure what project yet, but I've always been curious about these. I've always wanted to see what the reliability is like. So you will more than likely see me use these on this channel. Um, I might even use them in my Land Rover one ton build. I'm not sure yet. I haven't chosen the lockers for that, but these are just things you got to think about whenever you're selecting what locker works best for you. And I think that these could be a very viable option for the right build. The last locker we're going to talk about today is a selectable cable actuated locker. I'm so enticed by this concept. I think that there is so much potential for this to be by far the most reliable system because it doesn't require power or air. The only issue is that out of all the years of me wheeling, the last 16 years, I have only seen bad things with these lockers. Um, but I really honestly think that it is always an installation issue because it's kinked cables, it's poorly adjusted cables. So they think that it's locked in. Um, but there it's not. I mean, they're on t they're on rocks or something. One tire is spinning faster than the other. It's clearly not locked in, and that's an adjustment issue. So I think that there is a ton of room for this to be the best locker out there. I definitely want to try these out in the future. Um, hopefully, I can get my hands on a set one day. But it just needs to be installed correctly. Nice long sweeps with that cable, so you don't kink it and everything moves freely. And I think that these could be awesome. Another thing that Ox offers that I don't see out of anything else is the fact that you can undo the cable and you can put this like slug thing in there and it locks the locker in place. It's pretty sweet. You don't get that out of an electric or out of an air actuated locker. So I like the idea that if your cable breaks or your cable kinks or isn't adjusted right, whatever, but you need a locker right now, you can put this slug thing in there. It locks up your wheels you can get off the trail, and then if you need to drive it home, pull that bad boy out, put your cable back in, and you're back to having an open differential. So I think there's a lot of room for this to be an awesome locker. I just haven't had good experience with it yet, but stand by. In the future, I would like to get my hands on a set and install them and try them out for myself. Before I end this video, the last thing I wanna talk about is strength. The strength between all lockers is gonna be extremely similar in my opinion. Again, there's tons of my opinion in here, so don't take anything as fact. But consider this, all Dana 44 carriers are gonna be about the same size. All Dana 60 carriers are gonna be about the same size. All Dana 30 carriers are gonna be about the same size. The carrier is the locker. They're all gonna be using really high tensile strength chromoly steel components. And they're gonna be using really high grade, um, probably grade eight or higher bolts to bolt everything together. The differences in strength are gonna be so small that it's not gonna be something that is worth considering in my opinion. Um, the only exceptions would be the strength of a really small like lunchbox locker versus the strength of a Yukon Grizzly. But other than that, if you're trying to do like a ARB compared to a zip locker compared to an Ox, I think that they're all gonna be extremely strong. When you're considering what locker to get, I would look at reliability. What have you seen your friends use and have good luck with? Are, are your buddies using an electric locker and they love it and they've been on trails for years, trouble free? I would go with that. If you, or if you've seen your buddies use Airb air lockers, they've been running for six years. They go all over the country. They have no issues. Go with that. I think that we get way too hung up on which ones we think are better because whatever I have is the best, right? Um, that is such a common car guy thing, and I know that where I'm going to be lit up by car guys in these comments, I'm <laughs> where. 
people are so married to whatever brand they have, everything else is junk or garbage. That's usually the verbiage that they use. But those of you that are less experienced, I would say don't let these guys get into your head over what is garbage and, and everything else. Just think about what is going to work best for your build. Do you have onboard air? If you do, it's not that hard to put in an air locker. Um, are you willing to work with an electric locker or mess with the cable actuated locker? Just think about what, what works best for you and your installation abilities and your troubleshooting abilities before you choose what locker is going to work best for your build. If you enjoyed the video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. I've got a whole bunch of how-to content on here, and I'm always adding more. If you want to help support the channel, you can go to thedirtlifestyle.com. We have t-shirts, hats, swag. Um, I even have a link to our Patreon account if you want to help support us in that way too. If you want to follow me on social media, I'm at Dirt Lifestyle Nate. We'll see you next time.